Imagine. A parent playing out the whole, you treat this place like a hotel routine with a teenager. The scene inevitably ends with the teenager stomping upstairs and slamming the bedroom door. Sometime later they calm down, talk it through and the issue is resolved. They are learning how to manage the link between how they feel and how they behave. This is a critical skill in life and can give the individual the capability to hold down a job and to keep friends. But now imagine you are the person in the room, and the door has a lock on the inside so no one can get in. You might feel better for a while because you haven't had to face the issue. You may want to stay inside. No one can touch you, you feel safe, and you never have to deal with the everyday pressures. Sounds nice? But those same pressures continue to build up outside the door, the line growing longer, each person saying, I want a word with you about the money you still owe, hurtful things you said to me, the shoplifting charge, the bills you haven't paid. There comes a point when the line has become so long that you're too scared to ever leave. So why do people enter the room in the first place? Broadly speaking, there are three reasons. They discover the room at a time when they prefer to avoid confrontation. Typically this may happen during teenage years, when they may be experimenting anyway. There are specific traumas they want to escape from, and the room provides an effective haven for a while. There are mental health problems that the person is seeking relief from. We all know about pressure, and we know the many forms it can take. Family, friends, police, debt. Pressure can sometimes be a good thing. But when pressure is allowed to build up inside, it can seem so overwhelming that the only way out of it is to close yourself off from the world. And often the means of escape are as damaging as the things you're trying to leave behind. Before you know it, you're locked in a cycle of behaviour, too overwhelming to break free. That's where we come in. So how do we treat drug or alcohol users? We employ three phases of treatment. In phase one, we'll work to find stability in your life. We help remove the need to score, usually with the aid of a prescription, which helps to stop the line outside your door growing longer. Then we tidy up the room by improving your physical and mental health with the help of medical care or counselling. Phases 2 and 3 are often referred to as the recovery phases. Once you're healthy, you're in recovery. Phase 2 is about reducing the line outside the door and teaching you the skills to control pressures, so that when they return, you'll know how to respond. Finally, in Phase 3, we identify and build positive influences in your life to sustain you if things get rough again. This means rebuilding support structures with family and friends, and developing hobbies and interests, as well as meeting your basic human physical needs of secure shelter, warmth, and food. Then, together, we can stop that cycle for good. So when you open the door and step out, you'll face the world without fear. The Alcohol and Drug Service. Together, we hold the key.